Hello everyone. Today we are going to talk about utilitarianism. We have till now talked about consequentialism and hedonism as a moral theory. Today we talk about utilitarianism as a moral theory. Now, utilitarianism as generally put is called the greatest good of the greatest number. So, what matters here is good and of the greatest number. Now, what is the description of this thing called good? That brings variations in the various uh, shades of utilitarianism. Now, utilitarianism is basically based on the principle of utility. Now, let us read what does the principle of utility say. It says that the moral end to be sought in all that we do is the greatest possible balance of good over evil or the least possible balance of evil over good in the world as a whole. Here good and evil mean non-moral good and evil. It makes a few assumptions. It assumes that good or evil may be measured and here they are used as non-moral terms here. Now, this goes on to subscribe to something called ethical naturalism. We will talk about it in a short time. Now, what is it for a theory to be a utilitarian theory? What, what makes one a utilitarian? A utilitarian is one who is searching for utility, right? What is utility? Not usefulness per se, but it means that act uh, is high on utility that brings about the desired goodness. What is the desired goodness? Well, utilitarianism is mostly tied up with hedonism that, well, pleasure or happiness turns out to be the most desired uh, consequence. Now, let us take a, a few steps back and try to remember what all have we talked about. We have talked about consequentialism as a theory that, well, where we judge an act uh, depending on the consequence it yields. Now, what is this consequence? Now, utilitarianism puts forth that, well, it brings forth the greatest good of the greatest number. Hedonism uh, uh, claimed that it should bring about the pleasure. So, an act is right as long as it brings, brings about uh, maximizing pleasure. That was the hedonistic stand. The utilitarian stance talks about utility, that which brings about the maximum utility or that function which bring, helps in bringing about the desired consequences or what is good. Now, let us think slowly and carefully. The utilitarian makes a claim that, well, uh, we bring about something that is good for the greatest good of the greatest number. So, now, when we talked about the agents, how many agents are we talking about? We are talking about everyone. It could uh, be domain specific or universally that would include the whole world. Now, uh, an action is right if it brings about the greatest good of the greatest number. Now, what is this good and evil? Paying attention to the slide. Now, let us read the uh, uh, sentence once more. When it says that it is the greatest possible balance of good over evil. Now, here what is meant by good is a non-moral good. What does it mean? Well, it means that, well, so is evil here, a non-moral evil as suggested here. Now, what is a non-moral good? Now, a non-moral good would be something that is, uh, that has, uh, uh, cannot be reduced any further. Now, we have, uh, what is the utilitarian's notion? Utilitarian's notion of good is reducible to a naturalistic notion, a notion of say happiness. Now, uh, when you are happy, you or, uh, or generally know it naturally. You are biologically, psychologically equipped to be aware of your, of a stage when you are happy. So, the uh, happiness uh, is uh, to be understood as a natural notion. So, what comes out to be right or good is what brings about happiness. So, notice that well, good is being reduced to happiness. This is a function of reduction, right? That what is good, which almost looks like a smiley, good being reduced to happiness. Now, 
this good when it is reduced to happiness, we are also making a deeper claim. The deeper claim is that of naturalism. That is, we see that right and wrong are no more figments or creations or any abstract entities different from what abstract and distinct entities from what is natural. Now, there were times in the history of civilization when held a notion that well, the good and the bad and evil were something which depended upon something extrinsic, something abstract, maybe religion, maybe something which had nothing to do uh, with happiness. So, it might sometimes get along happiness, it might not, but that was not how it was defined. Now, the utilitarian defines it with uh, natural concepts of good and evil. So, well, uh, if, if uh, health is required or disease um, is an evil and health is a uh, good, which is a very naturalistic notion. So, any act that promotes health and uh, uh, stays keeps you away from disease is a right act to do. Now, the same thing at the level of a nation. Let us say that uh, a country decides to make one day or a city decides to make one day in the city a cycling uh, day. So, where everybody bicycles uh, to their uh, place of destiny, except of course, the emergency services and senior citizens and uh, all um, people who are uh, not capable of uh, using bicycles. Now, such a day uh, brings about the health or is contributes to a better uh, health of the population at large. So, a utilitarian decision could be to enforce that well, one day is a cycling day. Now, it, it uh, attains a proper good that is health, but this could also be a violation of rights. Let us look at it this way. Now, why if I am a citizen of that uh, city, I would ask the question that how and what gives you the right to take away my uh, freedom to use my vehicle on any day of the city. Now, the utilitarian well, it says that well, it is the greatest good of the greatest number and your individual freedom can be or may be uh, uh, subsumed or trampled more harshly put for this attainment of this greater goal. So, utilitarianism is not equivalent to totalitarianism, but it gives greatest happiness of the greatest number. Now, the natural question arises that what how do you arrive at this greatest happiness of the greatest number? Well, uh, now coming to the next slide, a little bit of history on ben on the utilitarianism. Please look at the slide. It says there was a philosopher called Bentham, Jeremy Bentham, who put forth this version of utilitarianism, which is called Gross, or more importantly, quantitative utilitarianism, which has been given a connotation of a Gross utilitarianism. Now. The quantitative utilitarianism says that the hedonic calculus of pleasures and pains during uh, using seven dimensions, uh, they are intensity, duration, certainty, propinquity or proximity, fecundity or fruitfulness, purity and extent. Now, what it is basically saying is that, well, happiness can be calculated. How? Well, because it has these seven factors. So, it has seven common factors. Any instance of happiness has seven common factors, and we need to determine that how these to what extent, right? So, suppose to take an an example that we are evaluating happiness 1. Now, H 1 has 7 factors, right. Now, each of these factors as mentioned here, all these 7 factors are multiplied by uh, what assessed in terms of these factors and then the summation is taken. Let us say, we do require quantitative utilitarianism to find out that well, electricity in two villages is better or you have uh, water supply in five or irrigation to five villages is better. So, 
uh, Bentham went ahead to actually form an entire uh, uh, school of utilitarianism called the quantitative utilitarians, who actually try to quantify happiness. And because this is necessary, quantify happiness not in any absolute sense, but in a relative sense. Relative sense vis-a-vis, -vis when we have two choices, what would bring the greatest happiness of the greatest number. Now, to me, my happiness is intuitively evident, but now let us not dismiss or uh, find something uh, uh, strange about these qu quantitative utilitarians. Look at it this way now. If quantitative utilitarians are making a claim of attaching numbers to happiness, it is not a silly thing. It is in fact a necessary thing to make, uh, uh, to make policy decisions say at a macro level. Say you would like to decide whether uh, uh, a beaming uh, uh, cable uh, TV to uh, 12 villages is more important or uh, uh, is, is righter that way than providing uh, mobile phone connectivity to one village. When choices are close by, when it is difficult to take an intuitive stand and which very often it is difficult at the macro level, a quantitative uh, or a philosophic calculus is always helpful. Now, using these seven factors, uh, 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 Bentham constructed a system wherein we can find the cumulative or the total sum of the pleasures, uh, uh, giving it a gross uh, uh, happiness value, right. So, an average gross here would not mean that lowly, but it would mean that a summation, a summation of the happiness value. So, an act A gives some total of uh, happiness value uh, as x and an act B gives a sum total of happiness value as y. Now, if x is greater than y, then A is a more desirable, is the uh, uh, right thing to do over B. Now, the, quali uh, the quantitative utilitarians are not so uh, 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 intuitively unaware that we tend to um, underestimate the power or uh, to attach numbers to one, uh, to one of the uh, happiness indexes. But then they have tried hard to work out whether that is at all possible. And they have worked out across uh, a, a model, a system of uh, attaching numbers to happiness. Now, there were some problems to this or some features. Now, the moment we mentioned seven common uh, uh, factors or characteristics of, of uh, uh, pleasure or a happiness, there was a problem. There was a problem that there seemed to be this, uh, uh, this kind of a classification seems to disregard the difference in various qualities of uh, happiness or pleasure. So, as the, the quantitative uh, utilitarians are ridiculed by the claim that well, if quantitative utilitarianism is true, then pushpin is as good as poetry or it does not make any difference between the intellectual pleasures and the what we would call uh, more superficial pleasures. It would not make a difference between watching a movie and say reading a classic. Now, let us look at gossiping and uh, watching a work of art. Now, to many of us it would seem that well, there is a, there is a difference in category in different kinds of happiness. So, qu uh, quantitative utilitarianism is perhaps failing in capturing that difference in qualities. The quantitative utilitarians do answer that well, these seven factors uh, give different, different weightage. Uh, and and maybe a uh, 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 utility uh, 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 happiness or, or a pleasure which is um, of purely the intellectual kind can be assessed higher in one of these uh, factors mentioned here. But well, any factor, say intensity or duration, we can strip up the intensity or again play around with these seven variables to find about uh, find out the value of the pleasure. Anyway. Now, to contra uh, to on further thinking, there was another philosopher called Mill, who proposed the theory of refined or qualitative utilitarianism. Now, notice that Mill and Bentham both preserve the utilitarian spirit, but it is um, Mill only makes uh, augments a difference to quantitative utilitarianism by adding that there are different qualities of pleasure and that cultural and intellectual are 
superior to pleasure. So, it makes a, a hierarchy of pleasures. Now, this hierarchy of pleasures was missing here, but it is present here. Now, Mill opined that this hierarchy of pleasure can better represent a calculation, better represent the philosophic calculus. Okay. Now, the qualitative utilitarians are like Mill or in the school of Mill claim that well, there are differences in kinds of pleasure and there that needs to be given weightage or attached value and that these earlier mentioned seven factors of the quantitative utilitarians do not capture that difference and this qualitative measure captures the difference. And, uh, uh, but nevertheless, we must uh, 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 be aware or we must remind ourselves that well, both of them are essentially in the same strain of uh, utilitarianism that where they are seeking. Uh, 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 the parameter or, or the paradigm of right or good as that which promotes the greatest good of the greatest number. Now, the recent utilitarians talk about a certain factors, certain factors like, well, maybe good needs a little more elaborate description, maybe health, uh, sufficient food, a proper place to stay is just not enough to de describe good. What is the constituent of this notion of good that the utilitarians put forth? Now, let us uh, take a look at the slide. Now, these are the recent uh, versions of utilitarianism, which comes out to question that, what is this entity called good? How do you describe it? Right? Now, remember that this good that they are talking about was non-moral good for the classical philosophers. It was health and happiness, right? But, well, new version of utilitarianism would like to say that it is not health and happiness, because that may be a universal minimum, but that is an act of universalization. Whereas, more optimistically or more egalitarianly, a better description of good would be something called preference satisfaction, right. Now, what is preference satisfaction? Preference satisfactions is that well, each one of us. Now, if you look at what I, I say is that each one of us is having an order or a hierarchy of preferences of different things in life. Some may value food more than rest, some may value rest more than leisure, some may value, value uh, leisure more than work. So, there is a wide variety or difference in the ways we make a hierarchy amongst our preferences. So, the utilitarian, the recent utilitarian trend has been to say that well, it is no more uh, just uh, a blanket good or happiness that uh, determines an action as a right action, but perhaps any action is right which promotes the greatest good of the greatest number and the greatest good here is greatest preference satisfaction. So, very uh, 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 commonsensically put it is that well, any, any act that would enable more people to exercise their uh, preferences, that to live out their preferences makes it a right act. Now, uh, transposing this claim to the, uh, the world around us today, we can perhaps see a very strong uh, evidence of preference satisfaction utilitarianism as a common goal. The government, the establishment, the institutions, the companies, everybody wants to give the individual as much freedom as possible, so that the individual can choose what is the, uh, to can, can choose according to his or her own preferences. Now, does not that make sense? We would say, uh, for an example, we would like to, uh, uh, because uh, you would, uh, the, the, uh, say uh, you are in an educational institute or a college, uh, you are staying in a hostel. Now, this hostel would like to give you 
each of you single room, so that each one of you can live the way you would like to live. So, uh, the good that perhaps uh, uh, communitarian living brings along, should be a matter of choice. If one deserves to be, uh, to live communitarianly, live in a double room or a triple room or a, uh, or a dormitory, there could be preferences like that. Maybe some people would like to, uh, would prefer to stay in a uh, dormitory or a, at least a two seater than a, a single room. Now, these are where the uh, individual's preferences come into the play. So, the utilitarian stops short of describing the content of good and puts that description to a, to the individual that we, uh, in a way relatively to every individual that whatever the individual would like to have as an order of preferences that becomes uh, uh, preference utilitarianism. Now, preference satisfaction as we look at the slide as an example of utilitarians who are non hedonists. Still now, we have been in talking about hedonists and utilitarians, right. We have been talking about people who have been both hedonists and utilitarians. Now, this is an example of somebody who is, who need not be a hedonist, may or may not be a hedonist, but is a utilitarian um, nevertheless. That is, uh, having one's own preferences satisfied. These preferences could be utilitarian, uh, could be hedonistic or not. Now, we would talk about uh, various versions of utilitarianism, uh, act utilitarianism and rule utilitarianism. Now, act utilitarianism claims that well, to determine the right action, the act utilitarian assesses all the consequences of any particular act and that which brings the greatest good for the greatest number is the right act. No rules or generalization from past experience. Rule utilitarianism uh, again places back the centrality of rules in morality and it further claims that we ought to determine, promote and follow rules that will promote the general good for everyone. Now, what to act utilitarianism? Now, we read out uh, the definitions of act and rule utilitarianism. Now, what does act utilitarianism say? Well, both of them are versions of utilitarianism. Both of them uh, believe in the greatest good of the greatest number. Now, they differ in the way we achieve the greatest good of the greatest number. The act utilitarian is an atomist believes to assess each act as to what, uh, how much good would it be getting over. So, in any case, uh, if we have a choice between two or more acts, we choose the act depending on all the consequences that the act brings along. Sounds fairly uh, um, simple, sounds perhaps a little convincing or perhaps not, because how can we assess all the uh, uh, possible consequences of an act and sitting at it, we would have to be uh, spend a lot of time before each act that we do. Well, the rule utilitarianism uh, hopes to come over this, this enormous uh, uh, temporality in uh, making decisions, in saying that well, I, uh, the rule utilitarians also believe that uh, in getting uh, out the greatest good of the greatest number, but how is where they differ. While the act utilitarians chose an act, saw its consequence uh, or forecast its consequences both direct and indirect and then decided that the rule utilitarianism believe in making rules that would bring about the greatest good of the greatest number. Now, say something like, should I lie or speak the truth? Now, the rule utilitarianism would say that, well, let us have a rule that would bring about the greatest good of the greatest number. Now, every time, neither can we contemplate, neither do we have the luxury of time to contemplate over what uh, this particular act might lead to. And secondly, nor are we able to be sure of the, uh, the actual consequences over the intended consequences. Now, these are problems with act utilitarianism. Rule utilitarianism hopes to jump this problem with the claim that, well, let us make rules. Let us make rules that bring about the greatest uh, uh, good of the greatest number. Suppose, we have seen that, well, uh, uh, in this particular act, my lying give, uh, brings in more benefit to 
most of the people involved, then my line becomes right. This is the act utilitarian version. The rule utilitarian version is claiming that, well, if I uh, have a rule that uh, I lie when it is convenient, will that lead to a happier state of affairs or an unhappier state of affairs? Now, if that leads to an unhappier state of affairs in the long run, including all possibilities, then it is perhaps not right or it, it is not leading to the greatest happiness of the greatest number. So, thereof the rule utilitarians try to explain that well, we would uh, uh, like to as, as written in the slide that we ought to determine, promote and follow rules that will promote the general good of everyone. So, the exercise, this exercise of determining, promoting and following also implicitly takes place. Perhaps, this originates with culture, its promotion comes with society and it is followed by the individual. Now, look at the various uh, 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 code of conduct that we have, say something like uh, uh, being considerate to the physically challenged. Now, it has evolved as a courtesy or, and it becomes a part of a culture. It is promoted by society, because if you do not look, it is uh, people look down upon you, if you are unkind to the physically challenged and it is followed by the individual. So, perhaps this is uh, an example of rule utilitarianism, where something, where our customs come to stay, because they lead to a greater happiness of the a greater number or general good for everyone. We would now talk about Mill's utilitarianism. As you would recollect, we have talked about the various versions of utilitarianism, uh, Bentham's refine, uh, gross utilitarianism, which was uh, quantitative in nature, it tried to uh, attach a number to all pleasures without making a distinction in categories. Mill uh, further refined this utilitarianism and thereof it was called refined utilitarianism or qualitative utilitarianism and it uh, made a distinction between the various categories of pleasure. Now, we uh, uh, take a look at an extra excerpt from uh, Mill's book on utilitarianism with the same name. Uh, let us look at the slide. It states that the utilitarian morality does recognize in human beings the power of sacrificing their own greatest good for the good of others. It only refuses to admit that the sacrifice is itself a good, a sacrifice which does not increase or tend to increase the sum total of happiness it considers wasted. Now, here what is uh, Mill basically trying to put forth? He is trying to uh, put forth that well, there is nothing in a sacrifice that is good in itself. There is nothing that is intrinsically, there is nothing intrinsically good in a sacrifice. So, in that there is nothing intrinsically good about any act. Now, what does this mean? Well, when he says that well, the utilitarian, uh, the refined utilitarian as per Mill admits that there is, uh, uh, that people do make greatest, great sacrifices, sacrifices, uh, sacrificing their greatest good for the good of the collective, but there is nothing in that sacrifice, which makes it a good by itself. The only thing that makes that sacrifice a good, is the consequence that it achieves or tends to achieve. Now, if it does not achieve that consequence, can it be further called good? That is where uh, perhaps the utilitarians uh, uh, encounter some difficult questions. Now, coming to the next slide, uh, we have talked about uh, act utilitarianism and rule utilitarianism. Act utilitarianism determines the right action. Uh, by assessing all the consequences of any particular act and that which brings the greatest good for the greatest number is the right act. Uh, 
there are no rules, no generalization from experience. Rule utilitarianism on the other hand, tries to determine, promote and follow rules that will promote the general good for everyone. Now, it has, it plays the centrality of rules in morality. Now, one might ask a question that, what is it in a rule uh, uh, or how, how uh, do the utilitarians being consequentialists ever stick to the rule as uh, uh, a credo of morality. Is not it the case that consequentialists always dependent on objectives and they stayed away from what was uh, uh, rules. Well, uh, utilitarians being consequentialists also value objectives, but there is a way of valuing objectives or judging by the, uh, by, by the consequences and still having rules about it. Let us take an example. Now, every time that you mix a cup of sugar or every time that you mix a uh, spoon of sugar to your tea, it gets sweeter. You know that, it seems to be trivially true. Are you ever uncertain that mixing uh, a spoon of sugar to your uh, cup of tea would make it less sweeter than what it was? Perhaps no, it would even be uh, uh, naive, not even naive, it would be uh, insane to ask or conceive such a thought. Now, let us just look at this simple example and what does it stand for? It stands for one, that well, we take that adding of sugar act makes the tea sweeter, the consequence. We take this connection between the act and the consequence as rigid and uh, uh, non-negotiable. Now, in the long run, if in the broad uh, picture, if we come to see that well, if there is a connection between uh, certain kinds of acts leading to more desirable uh, ends or uh, consequences, some acts which are better in bringing about uh, the greatest good of the greatest number. Shall we not make these uh, uh, acts or shall we not make rules that make these kind of acts desirable? Let us take an example. Now, say the act utilitarian, say we have a, a, a healthy person admitted to a hospital and uh, there are seven or eight patients requiring different organs. Now, this relatively healthy patient who has been admitted into the hospital possibly for a minor uh, ailment may actually uh, have, uh, uh, if, if the doctor is an act utilitarian in certain interpretations he would actually or she would actually like to uh, harvest the organs from this uh, healthy patient who has been admitted and well provide these necessary organs to all the other people who are in need of organs for survival. So, the death of one person could live, uh, lead to a flourishing or happiness uh, uh, and life and flourishing of another eight people. Act utilitarian, this seems to be sensible. Rule utilitarian would like to uh, make this, uh, make this act uh, uh, wrong by citing certain rules that this kind of a rule. Uh, if, if this thing is made a rule, it will not promote general happiness, because people, healthy people, people at large would start getting worried about going to the hospital, lest they lose their lives. So, it brings upon a general climate of uh, 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 insecurity, which is not conducive, in fact, which is contrary to a happy state of affairs. Now, let us uh, look at the slide. Now, the rule utilitarians would say that well, therefore, we have to determine certain rules, which we see in the long term that brings about the general good for everyone. So, it is a long term thinking, long term and a wide perspective, as wide as can be. So, these two would make uh, us, would liberate us from individual or atomic acts, rather uh, give us certain rules. Now, recent uh, utilitarians have uh, advanced further and now they have come out to uh, make a change in the content of good. Preference satisfaction is the key word that is being used here. Now, what is good depends on the individual, right. Now, 
let us say earlier what was good was equal to happiness, right. Now, this is where the preference utilitarian disjoints good from happiness. They put that you prefer to use the term preference satisfaction or uh, preference utilitarianism as the term. So, it commits to individualism, wherein we see that uh, having one's uh, uh, preferences satisfied is a criteria for, uh, for utilitarianism. Therefore, instead of greatest good of the greatest number, it becomes greatest preference satisfaction of the greatest number. So, well here, well uh, the preference utilitarian, now take a look at this preference uh, utilitarianism. Now, it is going away from the fundamental commitment of hedonism that uh, uh, utilitarianism stuck with that well happiness is a desirable, is the good and it is good for all. So, it was an unambiguous claim, a uh, naturalistic claim that well. Uh, happiness is a universal good and chasing happiness is the right thing to do. Now, the preference utilitarian uh, would rather say that it is our ability to make choices, to have preferences, to have a hierarchy between choices that is more important than what is the content of happiness. So, any system is good or any policy is good only or any act is good only when it enables. Uh, the greatest number of people to have the widest preference satisfaction possibility. So, unless until the satisfaction of one's preferences interferes with uh, the in, uh, another individual's uh, uh, preference satisfaction ability, it ought to be maintained. So, now this coming to the slide, this is called as preference utilitarianism. Sidgwick and Moore have been uh, proponents of such a theory. Now, taking a look at the slide. It uh, claims that here in preference utilitarianism, a utilitarian assessment of the situation takes into account the preferences of the individuals involved, except where those preferences come into direct conflict with the preference of others. So, preference satisfaction becomes the primary aim and there is no thrust as uh, thrust on happiness as the uh, single aim. This is where there is a departure from hedonism. Now, so we see this is a modern utilitarian tendencies that tend to be departing from hedonism and this is where we see today's urban lifestyles are uh, conducive to preference satisfaction of the wider variety. Uh, the notion of privacy, the notion of private space is again an uh, essential for maximizing preference satisfaction. Now, let us um, talk about some predicaments with uh, uh, utilitarianism. Let us talk about the first predicament, say medical experimentation and uh, uh, on uh, humans and animals. Now, let us construe a situation that where uh, we need to test a vaccine or a medication or a uh, medical procedure and we need a guinea pig for that. Now, guinea pig has entered into our colloquial terminology as uh, uh, being a sacrificial uh, creature. So, the very colloquial sense or connotation of the term guinea pig can make you understand why utilitarianism is a little different in treating rights. Now, the guinea pig has no rights of his or its own. The guinea pig is a means for the welfare of the majority. One sacrifice from uh, by the uh, guinea pig is essential for uh, the welfare of the majority. Now, most of the times it has been that animals have been used as uh, uh, testing uh, uh, testing uh, creatures for newer medications, vaccines, procedures, beauty products and a wide variety of things. Now, the utilitarian is quite uh, uh, simple in its thinking. Uh, 
he says uh, or it, it, it uh, urges that well, when it means the greatest happiness of the greatest number, why does it have to be uh, the happiness of only human beings? What is this number? Now, certain utilitarian philosophers like Peter Singer have extended this greatest number to uh, all sentient beings. Now, what are sentient beings? Now, if we extend this utilitarianism to sentient beings, that would include animals. So, now if we consider that well, if animals are, are sentient beings and are taking um, animals as, uh, as uh, guinea pigs for or testing uh, creatures in uh, laboratories and uh, huge uh, amounts of deaths or huge number of deaths happening of these animals of infecting them purposively with uh, pathogens and then uh, watching how the pathogen develops. Is not it spreading more harm than good? Is not it spreading more, more unhappiness than happiness? Well, if uh, the whole universe is taken as a uh, comprising of sentient beings, then just human beings have no stake or no uh, position in uh, inflicting suffering uh, to uh, advance their own survival, because it will be uh, a happiness of a few versus the unhappiness of the many. So, medical experimentation raises a crucial question that where does we, where do we find that well, uh, there is no uh, justification, no, no utilitarian justification for uh, sacrificing animals for uh, medical research. In fact, sometimes it is also that human beings are tried as uh, uh, test cases for uh, the last batch of uh, uh, vaccines to be uh, introduced of the prototypes. So, now, uh, a utilitarian would be very careful and in fact, that is has led to the formation of uh, animal rights activism and uh, uh, societies like societies of prevention of cruelty to animals of people's ethical treatment towards animals is that well, let us have the greatest happiness of the greatest number and this number would include all sentient beings. Right, but this would keep a serious stop to medical research. In fact, now there is uh, an increasing tendency to uh, reach an equilibrium uh, between uh, advancement in medical sciences and the use of sacrificial animals. In in schools, when laboratories in uh, uh, recommend a uh, inter um, operation or a opening up of a frog or a rabbit to s familiarize students with their inner parts. Now this is gradually being uh, seen as something which is uh, uh, unacceptable because it does increase suffering. So why not have plastic or, or any uh, synthetic made uh, creatures which can be used for uh, these uh, intersection that uh, the students do these operations that the students do. Now coming back to uh, the next thing that we talk about is compulsory organ harvesting. Now let us ask a question that well. If, if the law requires, right? Now coming to compulsory organ har harvesting, if the law requires the c that well, uh, any uh, cadaver or any uh, uh, corpse is liable to be harvested for uh, organs which might be uh, functioning and proper for uh, essentially for uh, transfer uh, for transferring to other patients who are in need of such organs. That by default or that uh, com uh, by compulsion, uh, no, no person can refuse uh, uh, the extraction or the harvesting of uh, the organs of uh, uh, his or her near and dear ones cadaver. In fact, let us also assume that no individual can make a commitment that well, we uh, uh, that uh, he or she would not uh, allow his or her organs to be harvested. Now, the utilitarian perspective is very clear. The utilitarian perspective would say that well, if uh, uh, I would like my uh, 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 the individual's choice about uh, his or her uh, body is immaterial, and as long as this individual uh, this choice this uh, uh, is not exercised in the negative, that is, an individual voluntarily being a utilitarian uh, oneself, uh, the individual offers his or her body to science, it actually benefits many others. So, this is a typical utilitarian goal. A problem occurs when this sacrifice is made out to be uh, 
as uh, uh, compulsory, as mandatory rather than as chosen. Now, is there something uh, wrong, if, if this sacrifice is supposed to be, is made mandatory? If there is something uh, intuitively uh, difficult with this, it is per perhaps because, what we are feeling is that, a uh, sense of right over one's own body is being violated. Uh, let us think about it. Now, would you sign a document, which would uh, uh, allow somebody, uh, which would allow a hospital or a doctor to harvest your organs, uh, after your death. Now, this would determine your position on utilitarianism. Now, uh, coming to it. Now, the other uh, problem that utilitarians face, imagine that you have chosen, and you have committed your uh, 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 body to uh, uh, a medical harvest. But unfortunately, uh, this agent who has committed oneself to uh, uh, donating his or her organs, meets with such an accident, where none of his or her organs are in a position to be harvested. Then, from the utilitarian consequentialist perspective, this sacrifice is belittled. This sacrifice does not hold value, because it essentially has not brought about more goodness. So, there has been nothing intrinsically right about this act of sacrifice, which uh, the agent in all good sense, perhaps made, but circumstantially was not able, it was not able to be implemented. Now, what about the other two crucial perspectives, that we talk about are environmental preservation and slavery. Now, these are also questions, that one needs to think, that well, why do we save the environment? Why are we concerned about the environment? Why are we concerned about the spe any species, that is about to go extinct? It is perhaps, because the environment is crucial, not only to our happiness of at this time, our meaning the entire uh, 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 human race, or uh, creatures existing uh, in uh, uh, the world right now, but also the greatest happiness of the greatest number over time. So, leaving a proper environment for the generations to come, is again a justification for saving the environment. Now, look at it this way, the utilitarian is actually uh, reducing his own self, to make it uh, uh, useful to the uh, coming generations. Now, but now let us look at another interesting predicament, that is slavery. Now, if a minor uh, section of the population is turned into slaves, who do all the uh, menial, menial or dangerous jobs, that are there in the society. So, that 95 percent or 99 percent of the society, lives a much happier state of affairs. Would that be something, uh, you would be uncomfortable with? Well, the utilitarian would say, that well, the sacrifice of this 1 percent, brings about greater uh, uh, happiness for the other 99 percent. So, why not go in for slavery? Slavery as something, but there was something, which we felt is intrinsically wrong with uh, uh, slavery. It, 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 despite of the fact, that it is a much more, perhaps a much more efficient system, and it does bring about the greatest happiness of the greatest number. Now, let us explore the limitations of, what do we mean by the greatest happiness of the greatest number. Now, happiness is a very uh, uh, vague term, as most of you would have perhaps realized, that well, happiness would mean, that one, uh, 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 that anything could be happiness. In fact, uh, uh, if you see in the slide, it writes, happiness is so broad, that it could mean preference satisfaction, or even any other goal or objective set by per, uh, the persons in the question. So, Actually, happiness then could mean the same thing as preference satisfaction. Now, if this is the case, then well, uh, preference satisfaction is nothing but restating the old thesis of utilitarianism. Now, another uh, limitation that we find with utilitarianism is that it depends on our ability to know what gives other people happiness, or what is uh, for uh, their general welfare. This is not always the case and may change from time to time. Now, the utilitarianism cannot, uh, the utilitarian cannot make a accurate forecast, and what, that what would give, uh, what gives other people happiness. Because, 
over a course of time, our uncertainty uh, could render certain objectives as or certain consequences as uh, contrary to the motivation that they caused earlier. So, for example, if we come up with uh, 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 say a, a, a parent comes up uh, with this uh, uh, policy that well, uh, she or he would raise a child uh, in a strict regimen. So, as to bring about a happy state of affairs, but uh, or the child grows up to be to study well and to be a successful individual, but he does not uh, do so. The uh, strictness, he reacts to the strictness and uh, uh, leaves home and runs away. Now, this does not bring about the happiness of the family. So, there is a difference always, which we talked about in consequentialism too, between the intended consequences and between the actual consequences. Now, let us uh, arrive at the uh, another limitation that it talks about, that it, what uh, it arrives at the ought from the is. Now, that is a crucial philosophical uh, leap that is taken by utilitarianism, which many philosophers uh, find unjustified. Now, can we that happiness is desirable, which again comes to the question paper, uh, happiness is desired, does that make, uh, make us uh, make it also uh, Im or imply that happiness is desirable or that we ought to pursue happiness. Now, this is a mistake that uh, many philosophers have pointed out that the utilitarian makes, that once we talk about what is the case, which is factually evident from uh, empirical uh, evidence, does not serve as a prescription or as a norm for what, how things should be. But, uh, paying attention on the slide, well the first another limitation that is pointed out, the moral call, a person has got to do what a person has got to do, well is a more political correct version of what is frequently said, that a man has got to do what a man has got to do. Well, uh, this moral call that we refer to, that acts that one feels that one should do irrespective of the consequences. Utilitarianism does not uh, pay attention or does not talk about uh, uh, these acts that which we feel perhaps morally obliged to do or have somehow a sense of uh, necessity to be done irrespective of the consequences that it uh, brings along. Now, the second point we talk about, what about failed great attempts? Now, the utilitarian is uh, uh, quiet, is in fact uh, uncharitable and unkind to failed great attempts, because uh, attempts that are uh, made for great things, but do not achieve their consequences, uh, judging by the consequences it does not matter. So, this is although a very uh, 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 a utilitarian could counter argue that well, uh, this is a rare of uh, rare uh, uh, thing to happen, but uh, nevertheless even if it is rare it is possible and if it is possible well, there is one instance where we see that uh, the moral act is not rewarded or acts that we perhaps tend to believe that is moral is discarded, because it does not achieve the objective. Now, the next limitation that they talk about is the central flavor of utilitarianism, there is a spelling mistake here. The central flavor of utilitarianism is that goodness does not inhere in an action, but is only given by setting that action in the context of the greatest happiness of the greatest number. So, this is a crucial philosophical position of utilitarians, that goodness does not lie in the action, it lies in the setting that brings about the consequences. So, thereof we can see that well, goodness is uh, the utilitarian takes the goodness away from the action and into the entire setting. Now, how, how, um, how would you judge? Uh, uh, an act which is is out of the setting or which could not achieve its intended consequences. Uh, another limitation that it has talked about that the utilitarian is more of a goal centered approach than an agent uh, centered approach. This is uh, essentially continuing in the same flavor that we talked about that more the uh, utilitarian is so much fixated on the goal uh, 
that the agent does not matter for him anymore. Now, looking at another limitation of utilitarianism, uh, that it justifies a paternalistic approach. Now, uh, the utilitarian, uh, since it values uh, the collective or the uh, greater number more than the individual. So, it does goad the individual into a pathway that is leading to the benefit of the uh, greater number. Now, paternalistic approach is certain in certain manners is uh, not is contrary to having one's own rights. Now, uh, another limitation which utilitarianism talks about is the, that utilitarian uh, that, uh, that is about utilitarianism that it does not take seriously the distinction between persons. Uh, this is pointed out by a philosopher called Rawls that utilitarianism uh, impersonal uh, an approach to some greater good. So, it takes does not take into account what is the each unique position that each individual is in. It puts everybody in one uh, common denominator. Now, another philosopher called Bernard Williams has pointed out that, what about recognizing the individual, the rights and the projects of the individual. Now, this has been a very common critique of uh, utilitarians that, well it is not, it is contrary to the rights of the individual. It is always uh, letting the greater uh, good dominate over the individual and the individual intrinsically no matter of what the consequences is, is supposed to have some rights. Now, this is the attitude which is being uh, subsumed by the utilitarian. Now, uh, the last critique of utilitarianism that we would be talking about is by a philosopher called Hume. Now, Hume says that the effects of an action uh, form part of a chain that stretches into an indefinite future there is always the possibility that uh, a very positive result of an action may subsequently lead to very negative consequences. Now, this is an essential claim which questions our causation or our principle. Now, if you would uh, remember the example that we talked about, about the uh, spoon of full of sugar in a cup of tea making it sweeter we thought that well, uh, putting a spoonful of sugar in the cup of tea only makes it sweeter. So, there is nothing uh, questionable about that. In fact, it seems to be trivially true, but it is perhaps not the case, because Hume's claim here brings about to the fact that well, we see that uh, uh, Hume's claim uh, brings to this, uh, to light this notice that well, perhaps uh, what we anticipate and what happens uh, need not always be the same. The, uh, in a relatively smaller example of the sugar mixing in the tea to make it sweeter, it seems to be more immune, but on a larger scale when uh, we do something which as Hume says is uh, an act that stretches into an indefinite future, the possibility that a very positive result of an action may lead to a very, very negative consequences. So, again we are not very sure about what it is. Uh, uh, that an act would lead to, that this greatest good of the greatest number eventually over time is not for us to see. It perhaps requires uh, uh, a God's eyes, uh, a God's point of view to or, or uh, uh, so to say uh, a perspective from nowhere or from everywhere to know what is the greater good. Because greater good over greater time, we have found many cases where uh, our notion of the greater good of the greatest number has changed over time. Say paternalism, say a form of uh, governance where, where uh, the collective takes important decisions on behalf of the individual was supposed to lead to the greatest happiness of the greatest number, but then it did not. Uh, systems that uh, or go uh, governments that followed that policies have failed. Uh, there are various instances throughout history where we find that well, uh, greatest the greatest happiness of the greatest number has been the motivation for uh, policies and acts, but in course of time that greatest uh, uh, happiness has be, be, uh, not or not only become insignificant, but also has been the cause of the greatest unhappiness. If we look around in India, the green revolution was supposed to be uh, where uh, the moral decision that we took was interfering in the course of nature uh, to yield more food. The green revolution was supposed to be a successful uh, 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 an act, an a, a, a scientific intervention into the order of uh, nature and agriculture for uh, 
uh, when you're getting out the greatest good of the greatest number, of providing food for all. But maybe 50 years of hence, scientists today do not have such an opinion that that uh, uh, intervention in uh, nature has been for the greatest good of the greatest number over time. So, uh, something like producing too much of food, something like uh, affluence. Affluence is, uh, we, uh, uh, India is in the throes of uh, a growing, uh, bludgeoning, uh, burgeoning, developing economy. So, does it mean that it will bring about, uh, the, the rational now is that it will bring about the greatest happiness of the greatest number, but will it, that is for us to see. So, perhaps the utilitarian in his ambitious uh, effort to, uh, and claim or uh, ambitious, but well, well natured uh, uh, intention of understanding what acts uh, would uh, eventually lead to what kind of uh, consequences is way overestimating our ability to forecast consequences over the length of time and the breadth of people. That would be all for utilitarianism.